And let us once again turn to God in prayer. Gracious God, we truly are thankful that you lead us in your love and in your mercy, that you grant us your peace and your life in Christ. And we pray that as we turn now to read your word, that in your Holy Spirit you would open our hearts and our minds and, and help us to be receptive to the planting of your word, your seed, into our lives, that we would grow in your grace. And we make our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. As we continue our journey through Lent, our text today in the New Testament is the scene in John's Gospel that concludes Jesus' public ministry. For after this scene that we will read in John's Gospel, Jesus then moves away from the public and then is with his disciples. And in John's Gospel, we won't see Jesus publicly again until his trial. And the, uh, and the scene that we'll see is, is the arrival of certain Greeks who desire to see Jesus. And these aren't just uh, Greek-speaking Jews who've come. These are real Greeks from Greece who have come to Jerusalem and they desire to see Jesus. And this event signals Jesus' hour. But first, we're going to be reading from the book of Psalms and reading a portion of Psalm 51. And as we also journey through Lent, it's a time when we open our hearts to God and, and seek his grace and his forgiveness. And this beautiful psalm points us in this wonderful way. So from Psalm 51, beginning with verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner, when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, I shall be clean. Wash me, I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. And from John's Gospel in the 12th chapter, we begin to read with verse 20. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. And they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus, and Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, 
It remains just a grain, a single grain, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. And those who love their life lose it. Those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. And the crowd standing there heard it, said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. And Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And he said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. As I visualized this scene and thought about it, reflected on it, I could see the crowds in my mind through this week. And they were drawn to Jesus as he taught and, and performed marvelous signs during this week. And in my mind, in the crowd, I could see them, these Greeks from Greece, there perhaps on the edge of the crowd, they were listening and watching and uh, observing all that was going on. Obviously, Gentiles, there perhaps on the edge of the crowd while Jesus was teaching during the week. And in my mind, I also saw Jesus seeing them, noticing them seeing the intention in their heart. And all the while, as he sees these Greeks, perhaps on the outskirts of the crowd, listening and seeking to draw closer, he could sense that the time was now coming and falling upon him. For somehow these Greeks represent inside Jesus the understanding that his hour, his hour had come. We have heard of his hour in the Gospel of John in the very beginning when Jesus performed the sign at the wedding in Cana. And his mother came to Jesus and said, they're out of wine. And Jesus turned to her and said, my hour has not yet come. And two times also in the gospel, when the tensions were arising around Jesus and the leadership was seeking to arrest him, the same thing was said as they were not able to seize him because his hour had not yet come. And the hour perhaps means, I think, that the final turn has been made. And the path that he has been walking towards the cross is now coming to a close. And it will soon be over. And it is the desire of these Greeks to see him that signals this. And the word there is not just for physical sight, but it, it, it speaks of a kind of seeing that is seeking to understand that's seeking to know, that's 
seeing in the hopes of, of learning and growing. The, the Greeks didn't want to just meet Jesus so that they could get his autograph. What they were seeking in seeing Jesus was establishing a relationship with him for something in Jesus Christ has drawn these Gentiles into his word. They want to see. They want to know him for themselves. And it's not that Jesus refuses to see them. But in his teaching in this text, he's pointing out that if they want to now see him to have this understanding, then they must follow where he is going. And then they will truly see. For they will see and experience in the cross the judgment of this world and the power that has kept all humankind in bondage he will break. And in this judgment, the world will now have access to him and to the Father. For Jesus opens the door. If anyone, if anyone, if anyone will serve me, he will now follow me where I am going. He opens the door. The bars are down. The way is cleared, the road is plowed. Anyone and everyone is now invited to come and see and to have eternal life. For Jesus said, when I am lifted up, I will draw all to myself. Not just these Greeks, but people everywhere will now have the opportunity to come and see. And Jesus says in this scene, he said, he who, who loves his life will lose it. But he who hates his life in this world will keep it to eternal life. And I think what Jesus is saying here is, is something that he said in another way, in another place. He said it this way. He said, he said, uh, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world, to lose his life, to lose his soul? <clears throat> and the beautiful irony is that if we turn from the world and turn to him, that we are given the love that empowers us to turn back to the world and to show it love in the best possible ways. That by turning to Jesus, we cease viewing the world as the place where our desires are met. But we begin to see the world as the place where God's desires can be accomplished through us. And by loving Christ, we are then enabled to truly love the world, to love our families, to love our friends, to love strangers that we meet in the street. We are able to, to love in a far, far better way than we ever dreamed possible before when we turn our lives to Christ. Indeed, Jesus opens the door to others through our witness, our service in his name. And we become the grain of seed that he casts into this earth. And in our life lived in his name, the fruit of his love is born anew and fresh. For his hour has come, and the wine of his life will now be poured out upon the whole world, the new wine of the kingdom that's present in him, where Jesus says, all of you, drink of this. 
And he prays, Father, glorify thy name. And the voice from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. And in some way, that beautifully expresses the whole of our faith, past and future. That God has had his name glorified in Jesus' ministry to this time, and in the future going forward, God's name will be glorified in in his death, in his resurrection, and then in his church. For we are those through whom God continues to glorify his name as we lift the cross of Christ and seek to follow him in his path of service and goodness and grace and forgiveness and love. We are those through whom the name of the Father is glorified in our service to Christ. Now, human categories of glory, just as an earth kind of thing, generally follow a different path. Where human glory sometimes is the thrill of victory, awards and achievements, degrees, zeros in the bank, business success, being able to hit a drive 285 yards down the fairway and just right down the middle. That's glory, right? They represent human achievement. It's not to say those things are bad. They represent human achievement that are often the result of tremendous effort and even painful sacrifice. But the question that we would ask of human glory is perhaps this. Do these result in personal selfishness and pride that sees the achievement as making a distinction of value? You know, I can hit the drive and you can't, you know. Or do these human glories provide a path for others also to be ennobled and even in some ways blessed. And if we find that our achievement opens in some ways a door for others, then we are following a kingdom kind of road, the road that Jesus walks, where his degree or victory or success is going to be displayed in his sacrificial giving of self to the glory of God and our benefit, for he will say that he is going to lay down his life for his friends. And we are all included in the circle of this friendship. By his grace, we are all brought together in this beautiful circle of love. And we, along with brothers and sisters through the centuries, have become part of the trail of glory that has lit the way for countless others to come and see. Maybe in some way we identify with these Greeks on the edge of the crowd, watching, hoping, longing, but hanging back, perhaps afraid, afraid perhaps of judgment. But Jesus said this, he said, This is the judgment that light has come into the world. And in just a few verses in the text, you'll see Jesus saying this, I did not come into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved. Don't we inwardly hunger to be loved this deeply? Don't we inwardly hunger to be considered so valuable by one so great that he would give his life in exchange? For we are living this day within the eternal hour of Jesus. His hour struck that day and on resurrection morning the world awakened to a whole new kind of time. 
So as we continue on our Lenten journey, let us continue to draw near to him. Let us come. Let us see. Let us live. In Jesus' name, amen.